Yeah, thank you for the introduction and uh, invi invitation. So hello everyone, I'm very excited to have this opportunity to talk about my research. So today's topic is on efficient hardware architecture via a unit computing for deep learning. Uh, the, the rapid advancement of uh, interdisciplinary technologies has allowed the emergence of diverse devices and hardware systems that improve our well-being. To name a few, autonomous driving, AR, VR, the smart inter infrastructure, and the digital ha uh, healthcare. So those emerging applications are increasingly relying on deep learning, creating new demands on computer ability and starting to put a lot of pressure on computer architect to build systems that can meet the power and the resource constraints of those applications. From my perspective as a computer architect, the computer efficiency is a key to live up to the promises of this of those systems. So for example, the property is like the sustainability and accuracy in autonomous driving, the security and privacy in AR, VR, reliability and longevity in smart infrastructure, accessibility and uh, safety in digital healthcare. Now, all of these in some way are made possible by how efficient the hardware architecture is designed. However, we still have a long way to go. There's a gap of several orders of magnitude between what is needed and what, what is achievable in terms of power efficient design. The power efficiency has been well started in many ways in the computer architecture community across a wide spectrum of power constraints ranging from kilowatts to milliwatts. There was a prosperity of deep learning in the big data era. Various technologies are leveraged to lower the po uh, compute power at the server level, including dynamic voltage frequency scaling, a switching and leakage optimizations, and the data flow optimizations. The coming to the end of Moore's law, researchers also started to examine in-memory or near-memory computing, for example, but uh, for uh, future improvements in modern systems. However, the new technologies need to be explored uh, to reach the efficiency levels needed at the milliwatts level, where my research lies. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, one focus of my past research on a novel computing paradigm, unit computing. My research vision is to explore non-conventional unit computing to achieve new levels of power efficiency, especially for the deep learning applications. And here's a brief summary of this talk. First, I will give the fundamentals of unit computing. As specifically, I will describe why unit computing has the potential to serve as a first-class citizen in power efficient computer architecture. Now, what unit computing exactly is and how to do unit computing practically. Then I will introduce how to leverage unit computing to engineer a brain computer interface via algorithm hardware code design. At last, I will showcase how to design a unit gem architecture via temporal coding, which is able to perform gem without multipliers. Now let me start a tutorial on uh, unit computing fundamentals. The first off, you might be asking, why unit computing? The answer is surprisingly simple. On the left is a conventional binary multiplier, which is at the core of modern deep learning hardware. This multiplier requires hundreds or thousands of gates, depends on the precision. On the right is a unary multiplier, which is as simple as one end gate. Such simplicity brings unary computing up to several orders of magnitude improvement in power and uh, energy over the binary counterpart. Though unit computing is promising for deep learning, it is not a new concept. It dates back to the late 1960s and uh, has found applications in signal processing and error correction. With the recent prosperity of deep learning, unit computing is rejuvenated due to its efficiency promise and the robustness to noises. So, Next, let's see what exactly unary computing is. Let me first show you how unary data are generated, are represented. The figures on the left and right 
are examples of, of binary and unary data respectively. For the purpose of this presentation, I assume all data values are already scaled to between zero and one. This is a, a pretty common assumption in unary computing. And for the binary and unary data examples shown here, uh, they all encode a value of 0 0.5. Note that the binary data encodes bits with weighted significance, and which are typically processed in parallel. On the contrary, a unary data has serial bits called bit streams, with each bit having identical significance. The unary data is typically inter interpreted as the probability of seeing a one in the bit ring. In this example, there are eight out of 16 ones in the bit ring, yielding the value of 0 0.5. This encoding of unary data is known as rate coding, where the bits are randomly distributed. This is also more commonly referred to as stochastic computing. In addition, temporal coding is another kind of popular unary encoding uh, where the zeros are deterministically following ones, as shown on the right. And uh, I think Dr. Uh, uh, Najafi ca called it a unary processing in the early times. So different people had different names. Um, then I'll show you how the unary streams are generated. In order to generate those unary data from the source binary data, we need to compare the source value with a number sequence. For rate coding, this number sequence is a random sequence from a random number generator. I will show you an example here. So one bit of the unary bit stream is generated per cycle. And the probability of ones in the bit stream gradually converges to match the source value. Thus, the longer the bit stream is, the more accurately it reflects the source value. For temporal computing, this number sequence is the output sequence of a counter. Then after the bit streams are generated, they can be fed to the unary arithmetic hardware to perform computations. The unary hardware is ex extremely simple. For example, a multiplier and add can be implemented with an AND gate and a MUX, respectively. So as you can see in the top example, passing two bit streams that encode the value 0 0.5 to an end gate produces a resulting bit stream with a value of 0 0.25, which is effectively the product of the two inputs. And as shown in the bottom example, addition in unary computing is typically scaled to avoid saturating above the value one. Thus, the addition usually computes the arithmetic mean. This is done by passing the input bit streams to a MUX whose select signal uh, randomly choose between the two input. These are just two examples, a couple of examples of how unary computing is performed, but they are the important ones for many learning applications used today. Now I have, uh, I hope I, I've been, uh, done a good job in showing case how uh, why and what is unary computing. The key takeaway is that the unary data is encoded as bit streams and the unary hardware is simple. So however, uh, however, the unary computing has its own challenges. To make it practically applicable, I will present to you my solutions to those challenges next. So uh, I'm not sure uh, you want to ask a question now or uh, you want to leave the question to the end. I guess uh, we can wait until the end of your talk. OK. Huh? Uh, then uh, let's move on to the first research contribution I, have, uh, I would like to talk about, the UGEM, which targets the fundamental challenges in unary computing for the GEM applications. So we, coming to the deep learning era, the general matrix multiplication for short GEM uh, becomes the core operation. As we saw in prior examples, a unary gem architecture has the potential to greatly reduce the hardware cost and improve the efficiency of a binary hardware. However, however, this is not an easy task. This work aimed to address the two research challenges that 
have made it very difficult to build efficient unary architecture for JET, inaccuracy and long latency. To achieve this, UGM is designed to be universally compatible to different kind of input encodings with high accuracy. Then by chaining multiple UGM blocks together, the latency and efficiency can be significantly improved with the help of a determination without losing too much accuracy. So all those features together enable dynamic energy accuracy scaling on resource constrained systems. Moreover, to lower the barrier to entry, a general purpose simulation framework for unary computing, uh, unary sim is made public, uh, publicly available. The UGM sets up a foundation of my follow-up unary computing research. All right, so now let's talk about the first uh, inaccuracy challenge. The inaccuracy challenge in unary computing is due to its probabilistic nature and is a result of a correlation between the bit streams. Correlation is a measurement of the bit stream similarity. The equation is given, oops, messed up a little bit. Okay, the, uh, it is defined as below and uh, where the bit streams have a length of L and ABCD represents the amount of each possible bit pair. And the number of bit pairs is the key factor that impact the correlation value. But the previous uh, equation is too much for this talk. So a simplifying view of the correlation is that how similar those bit streams are. Let's see some examples first with a focus on the alignment of ones. In those examples, all the bit streams have eight ones out of 16 bits. In the first example, it has a, a positive one correlation. It means it has a maximum of eight aligned ones. In the second example shows the zero correlation where only four ones are aligned. Then in the third example, it indicates uh, my, uh, negative one correlation where no aligned one exists. So basically we can interpret the correlation as the level of aligned ones between the bit streams. Now I will show you how those different correlation values impact the multiplication accuracy, which has been a headache for almost half a century. So here, are three examples. Although all of them share one common input A, while the second input differs from each other. As such, they show different correlation values. For example, the first one is zero, second uh, positive one, and the negative one for the loss. Then the number of aligned ones determines the output value in those examples. And zero correlation gives the correct product, while non-zero correlation does not. In fact, their correlation is both necessary and uh, uh, sufficient for precise unary computing, a uh, unary multiplication. Then you might be asking, why is this happening? To understand the reason, we compare the desired behavior of unary multiplication and the actual behavior of the AND gate. The desired multiplication behavior is PX equals PA by PB where the PB is a marginal probability. In the correct multiplication example on the right, P, uh, on the left, the PB have a value of eight over uh, 16, which is 0 0.5. Then the actual behave and gate behavior of P is that PX equals PA and B then it becomes PA by PB given A. And what B contributes now is a conditional probability instead of a marginal probability. In the correct multiplication with zero correlations, the conditional probability is 0 0.5, identical to the marginal probability. However, in the incorrect multiplication with positive one correlation, the conditional probability is one, different from the marginal probability 0 0.5. The comparison above show 
that uh, the accurate unary multiplication requires the equivalence between conditional and marginal probability. Then how does such equivalence impact the correlation mathematically? According to the equivalence, we first derive the relationship among different bit pairs. Then we plug in uh, the above equation into the correlation definition and find out that the resultant correlation is a constant zero. As such, the requirement of equivalence between conditional and the marginal probability guarantee correct unary multiplication. Then translating this requirement to hardware is surprisingly simple. On the left is a conventional multiplier with bitstream generation logic show for both input. On the right is our proposed multiplier. The magic here is that now we just use A to enable the update of the random number generator for B, indicated by the red line, and we call it a conditional bitstream generation. This circuit generate uh, guarantees a zero correlation, correlation for arbitrary input A. <clears throat> Sorry. To this end, the inaccuracy problem for unary multiplication, which has been there for half a century can be solved with nearly zero overhead. And this is my solution. And there are other solutions uh, available. And one of the work is the convolution-based theory from Dr. Najafi. And I like that very much. Uh, after multiplication, we move on to the addition. The example here is a scale, scaled addition, which use a MUX gate to calculate the arithmetic mean. The two input has values of 0.25 and 0.75. While the scaling by half is down uh, by fitting a select bitstream uh, value to 0.5. If this select bitstream does not correlate with either input, uh, the output is accurate. Unfortunately, correlation indeed happens. And let's see two examples here, uh, each with a different uh, select a stream leading to different correlations. Again, we observe that zero, zero correlation gives the, cor uh, the correct sum here. Uh, this is similar to what happens in the unary multiplication, and I skipped the reasoning here. To obtain accurate addition, record that we are calculating the arithmetic mean of all the input. With two inputs, we just need to output a one every two ones come in. The correspondent hardware is shown below. It performs the input accumulation to accumulate all the input ones and overflow the carry as the output. This circuit does not put any correlation constraints on the input resulting in uh, high accuracy. So by now we have solved the accuracy problem in unary multiplication and addition. Uh, next, let's move on to the long latency challenge in unary computing. The, the root cause of long latency is the bitstream representation of unary data. The examples below show that one more data, data bit improves the data precision, but doubles the latency. Though higher precision improves the accuracy, it also exponentially exacerbates the energy consumption. Therefore, in resource-constrained systems, it is essential to strike a balance between the accuracy and the latency. To reduce the latency, uh, early termination, which is stop the compute, uh, stop computing a bit stream early is viable. Then to what extent does early termination impact the accuracy? This is the question we actually care. Our observation is that the with care, a partial bit stream can approximate the encoded value with minor errors. So based on this fact, we design a novel metric, a stability, to reliably infer when to early terminate. More specifically, we, def we define stability to measure how fast a bit stream becomes stable within a predefined accuracy budget. Now let's see the example to better understand this concept. A bit stream is shown uh, together uh, with the time axis below. 
Here, the predefined accuracy budget is five percentage error. And uh, the first 10 bits in red are unstable, which means their accuracy uh, frequently exceeds this error budget. So when it comes to the black bits, the accuracy at any time always stays within five percentage error budget. So the stability now is calculated as one minus the number of 10 red unstable bit over a total of 32 bits. The stability matrix viewed an explicit connection between the accuracy and the latency. Eventually, the latency can be reduced by a ratio of stability reliably without errors beyond the budget. So overall, this UGEM work that lowers the barriers for, to entry for unary computing and saves the effort in building a practical unary gem architecture. Okay, now I will uh, move on to the next topic, which is a U-Brain uh, as an example of how to uh, use unary computing to build an uh, efficient brain computer interface. So a brain computer interface is a tiny but mighty systems that collect, com communicate, and uh, manipulate brain signals, which have the varying uh, signal modalities depending on where the electrodes are placed. The diverse functionalities pose a very stringent constraints on the task accuracy and the power consumption. So for example, for serial prediction, no one wants even one misprediction. For implantable BCIs, the power cannot exceed the 50 milliwatts. To support diverse BCI tasks while keeping the brain safe, BCIs has a stringent accuracy and power constraints simultaneously. However, existing BCIs fail to reach the above goal in a real-time manner. The, to this end, the U-Brain comes as a rescue while uh, algorithm and the hardware co-design. So in this work, I specifically focus on the EEG-based BCIs using the headset, but this methodology is seamlessly uh, applicable to other modalities. Then let's uh, let me introduce to you how you brain deal with the accuracy and uh, power challenges. The accuracy of uh, BCI is mainly impacted by the choice of the algorithm. Here's an example of existing EEG-based BCIs with classical feature engineering. It involves uh, five stages, including signal acquisition, pre-processing, feature extraction, classification, and uh, optional feedback stimulus. With a recent advance in deep learning, three stages in the middle can be merged into a single DNA, significantly lowering the complexity of the BCI hardware. More important is that the DNAs can substantially increase the accuracy of BCIs over the classical feature engineering as shown in this table. So even the lower bound accuracy of DNAs is higher than the upper bound accuracy of the classical algorithm. So this fact motivates the adoption of DNAs in uh, your brain work. The follow-up question is that can cumbersome DNAs be efficient enough for BCIs? And the answer is yes, after a few explorations. We search the DNN model space and identify such a DNN. Then the diagram below shows how the DNN works. The raw signals from the scalp are collected by the electrodes and sent to the DNN directly. The DNN has three paths. The first path is a CNN to extract the feature, uh, spatial features at a specific time step. In the second part, the extracted spatial features are fed to the LSTM layers to extract the temporal features across multi, uh, multiple time steps. The final part is a FC layer to classify the output. To maintain high accuracy, we leverage the theory from UGEM to build uh, to implement the uh, hardware inside the U-Brain. With proper uh, DNA 
compression, eventually we decrease the model size from 60 to one megabyte with negligible accuracy loss from uh, 70, uh, 97% to uh, 95%. Uh, even better is that we can reuse this model architecture for multiple BCI tasks without customizing the DNN for each task. This leads to extra power efficiency improvement due to reusing the, the same hardware. I, I will show the uh, accuracy and the power result later. So now let's, uh, uh, let's move on to the power challenge, uh, which will require co-design effort on the hardware side for better efficiency. The main contributors are the sensor and uh, hardware pipeline. In terms of the sensors, existing BCIs use traditional ADCs, which are really expensive. In your brain, we directly convert the analog signal to unary bit streams and avoid those ADCs. The analog to temporal conversion, for short, the ATC, is used for this conversion. The ATC first uh, senses the brain signal and store it in the analog memory, usually a capacitor, and then they store then the stored raw signal is compared to a linear ramp signal in the analog domain. And the output is a desired bit stream with temporal coding, uh, where zeros always follow ones. The resultant ATC uh, is about 12 times smaller than the ADC, uh, boosting the hardware efficiency, especially for those uh, BCI systems with up to thousands of channels. This Optimization is especially promising for uh, future BCI system with a uh, significant amount of channels. Oops. Oh, yeah. Besides the sensors, the hardware pipeline is another source of a power threat. The classical feature engineering, for example, the uh, FFT, DWT, they always require that all data should be ready before the compute start. As such, the time to sense and uh, store the data are not fully utilized for the compute. The following, this is an example of conventional designs. The zero to eight, uh, zero to nine uh, signal are first collected and once they are ready, the compute start. However, the problem is this leads to less compute time and higher peak power, threatening the safety. To make the best use of the time resource, your brain is designed to start the compute right after the data are sensed. The corresponding hardware pipeline is shown as below. Every time when a new uh, brain signal from a new time set comes, the computa computation starts. One extra benefit is that now no storage is needed anymore, as the raw signals are converted to bit stream directly and uh, participate in computing. The unary uh, U brain allows more computer time and lowers the power. And all of those benefits are enabled by the DAN and ATC. So I have covered the algorithm and the hardware solutions to the challenges in the BCI, and here's a co-designed U-Brain architecture. The in U-Brain, uh, each layer has a dedicated hardware and works on one unique data sample at a time, so that different data samples are processed in fully pipeline manner. For example, the raw signal sampled at the time step t via ATC are directly consumed by conv1 layer. In the meantime, the signal sampled at the previous time step t minus one is being processed in the conv2 layer. Multiple signal samples are processed in your brain simultaneously. There are several advantages about this architecture. So first, the pipeline execution contributes significantly to the accuracy because the bit streams are converted back to the binary domain after each layer, indicated by the vertical dash lines. The second is 
Hybridizing tempera and rate coding in certain layers minimize the hardware cost significantly because it allows aggressive sharing of the BStream generation logic. Third, this architecture minimizes the complexity of the control flow and eliminate the need for a costly control processor to schedule the data. Now, given all those high-level optimizations, uh, I will show you uh, briefly how Ubrain does. We evaluate the DNN execution on Ubrain against a 14-point CPU and int 8 sysolic array. The power advantage of Ubrain mainly results from the orders of magnitude lower running frequency due to the maximized compute time. Uh, then let's see the accuracy of two different tasks. The first task, the motor imagery, means that the BCI is trying to infer what is imagined in your brain. Uh, there are five categories of imaginations. And the second task is a serial prediction, which means the BCI is trying to infer, uh, infer what whether a serial is on set or not. We scale the position of uh, different uh, BCIs, and in general, accuracy increases with larger B widths. Then at 10 bits, you brain almost closes the accuracy gap with others, and we choose 10 bits for you brain hardware. So finally, we show the power of different BCIs under uh, identical latency constraints. Uh, though CPU and the systolic arrays can tune their running frequency and power indicated by each of the points on the curve, your brain is still better than their best numbers by up to uh, 5.5 times and uh, 1.6 times. Okay, this concludes the U brain work. Uh, now let's move on to the last water carrot. So in this work, we identify a novel opportunity for parallel computing called the value level parallelism. With this technique, hardware can execute GM in a multiplier free manner for better efficiency. So in this era of deep learning, uh, especially in the cloud, the data are becoming more batched and have lower precision, like uh, this table presents the evolution of the tensor cores uh, in NVIDIA and AMD GPUs. The narrow data formats are gradually commercialized in the last decades for efficient deep learning. And FB8 just came out last year, uh, maybe early this year. So given such a trend, we observed that not all performed computations are necessary, especially for the GM architectures. So let's see a toy example here. So we have 1,000 uh, unsigned int4 input to be multiplied with a single weight w. There are only 16 unique products from uh, w by 0 to w by 50. However, the conventional hardware needs to perform 1,000 multiplications which is 64 times more than actually needed. That's fundamentally inefficient. To avoid the redundant computation, we propose value level parallelism for the gen, as shown below. It consists of two parts. The first part is the value reuse. It, it means un unique products are computed only once and reused by all the input. The second part is the subscription. It means each input subscribe to its product in parallel without recomputing the same products again and again. A illustrative uh, circuit example is given on the right. Value reuse is implemented as a recursive accumulation over uh, the weight w here, thus multiplier free. The subscription is implemented using temporal coding to achieve the awareness of the correct product. We will present the details later. Then for uh, value level parallelism, we observe 
consistently high opportunity in different settings. So in this graph, the X axis is the unique Mantita value for each data format. And uh, the Y axis is the opportunity for the uh, value reuse, uh, which measures how many inputs can reuse the same output. It is calculated as the input count for each unique Mantisa value. Then the three curves from the top to the bottom are the maxi, maximum, average, and the minimum reuse opportunity. In both vision and language models, we observe abundant reuse opportunity. The low precision FP8 data, uh, data format exposes more opportunities than the FP6, uh, FP, uh, BF16. So understanding the urgent need for the value level parallelism, now I will present you the theory of value par uh, VLP. So first we recap the temporal, co temporal coding. For VLP, we use spike timing to represent the data. The data value equals the timing when a spike occurs. So for example, now the data, uh, the da source data is six and the spike occurs at the sixth cycle. Then I showcase how to utilize the VLP for vector scalar multiplication. To start with, we have a multiplication between uh, input i and uh, a weight w in one. Then from one to two, we actually convert the multiplication to accumulation over w through time. The maximum rounds of accumulation depends on the position of the input i. Then from two to three, uh, the input will subscribe to the products via temporal coding. More specifically, at the i cycle, the value of the accumulated partial product is i by w and selected as the output, enabled by the spike occurring at the same cycle. Then from three to four, uh, with a vector input i, all the input values can subscribe to the output in parallel. Throughout the process, all results are computed only once and reused by all the input via temporal coding based subscription, achieving value level parallel. Then we move on to the architecture part. And here's the example of VLP architecture for gen and uh, double uh, carrot. So first, the memory hierarchy of carrot is identical to other GM accelerators, uh, like SRAM for the on-chip data reuse, FIFOs for data synchronization, everything double buffered to hide the access latency. And uh, the second, uh, the compute array is calculating a outer product with each columns of PEs calculating a vector scalar multiplication as I showed previously. Then we zoom into a column of uh, processing element. Uh, each of the PE columns together with a temporal converter is a basic unit to calculate a vector scalar multiplication via VLP. The scalar is accumulated in the uh, ACC accumulator at the top. Uh, while the input vector comes in from the left-hand side. Each TC uh, temporal converter and the PE pipelines uh, counter sequence and accumulates a partial result uh, downwards so that the spike and products are always synchronized. Here's the internal of a TC. The TC, uh, the TC generates the temporal signal from the Mantisa bit MD uh, of the input and the counter value and handles the special values in a 14-point format. Now, don't worry about the notation here. They, uh, they don't bother the understanding of the key ideas. Uh, then the PE subscribe to the product when a Mantisa temporal spike, MT, arrives. The subscription, the subscription is outputting the uh, product when a spike arrives, otherwise it will be always zero. 
So this behavior significantly saves the energy consumption by lowering the switching activity. So next, uh, a role of PE is shown below, and it has three functionalities. The first, it shares the temporal signal by poplining it from the left to the right in red, which saves the cost of regenerating the temporal signal. The second is fully pipelines the computation by allowing two concurrent spikes in a row in the pipeline, uh, in the ping pong buffer, uh, indicated by the path from the PE to the output. Third, it handles special values in floating point data marked by the path from the TC to the output. A walkthrough example is given uh, here to better understand how carrot works. On the left is the TC column, uh, where MD is the mantissa and C is the counter value. On the right is the PE array, where A is accumulated partial product. Uh, note that we optimize the accumulation to start from A times the weight. Then the state transition from uh, cycle zero to cycle nine is animated here. We fill in the TC or PE with red for a first set of the input and a green for a second set of the input when a spike occurs. The second set of the input can start right after the temporal signals of the first sets are generated. For the TC column, uh, the counter generates a sequence and uh, propagates the numbers downwards in at each cycle. Uh, if the input mantissa equals the counter value, the spike, a spike is generated marked by a colored triangle. A PE column will propagate accumulated product, uh, uh, accumulated product downwards and subscribe to a product when a spike arrives marked by a colored PE. Now within a PE row, when a temporal spike is generated, it will be propagated in a row from the left to the right at each cycle. The subscribed product will also be routed to the output. So after we have the outer product for multiple sets of input vector pairs, we can accumulate, the, we can accumulate them element wisely towards the full gen result. Now knowing how the carrot works, we move on to the evaluation. So with the hardware and uh, workload setup shown as below. The, for the hardware, we compare carrot with both binary and the unary systolic arrays, as, uh, as well as a prior work RIS that performs computation reuse. Uh, all the values have identical SRAM set, uh, all the designs have identical uh, I, SRAM settings except the unary systolic array, which interacts with the off-chip memory directly due to the multiplication is multi-cycle, thus low bandwidth. The array size setting ensures that a carrot and other designs ha has a similar number of a in point unit or on-chip area. All the designs uh, adopt FP8 multiplication and BF16 accumulation, except a unary systolic array. Which, all, which only works with the integer operations. For the workload, we use the MLPerf benchmark, uh, which is an industry benchmark for deep learning. Uh, it includes several uh, landmark DNNs in the last decades, covering applications like uh, uh, image classification, segmentation, uh, object detection, speech recognition. <clears throat> Sorry. Also, language, uh, natural language processing recommendation, and so on. Uh, to map those uh, DNs to the computer arrays, we search optimize the data flows to improve the array utilization. Now, and for the evaluation, we first uh, examine whether VLP really benefits from a large batch size. We, we vary the batch size from 1 to 256 for all DNNs, and the throughput numbers are 
normalized to that of the binary systolic array with a batch size of one. Unary systolic array exhibits uh, the lowest uh, throughput among all designs due to multi-cycle unary multiplication. Binary systolic array and RIS with computation reuse show conspicuous uh, throughput increase for matrix multiplication dominated DNs like BERT, DRM, RNT. However, the improvement uh, saturates quickly at a medium batch size for a matrix convolution dominated DNs. And the, uh, the improvement is negligible. For carrot and small batch sizes, the throughput is usually lower than the binary systolic array due to underutilization. But we observe a throughput improvement on all DNNs at larger batch sizes. This, this experiment demonstrates that, okay, a carrot actually benefits from larger batch sizes because of its vector scalar organization. Next, we examine whether uh, VLP live up to its promise and improve the efficiency by varying the array size of different designs. So the figure here shows that when scaling up the array size, the throughput of all designs increases. And um, the carrot uh, always outperform others. Then we show the comparison of the area and the energy below. When increasing the array size, the carrot area increases quickly, while the energy does not. The main source of the area overhead is the input FIFO in carrot. However, due to the long cycles of temporal signals, large FIFOs lead to marginal energy overhead. This means that the carrot with VLP indeed offers energy, uh, the efficiency benefit over conventional GM architectures. Now, furthermore, we zoom into the, the area breakdown of different designs. For baselines, most of the area uh, have a resource are dedicated to the PEs. These PEs are computation oriented and contains a very expensive Mac unit. On the contrary, the Mac, uh, the carrot PEs uh, only counts for 7% of the total area as they are designed for subscription using simple AND gate. Such a low cost in PE is a key to carrot's advantage and opens up new design spaces for deep learning accelerations. So finally, uh, that concludes the, the uh, carrot work. So, uh, so finally, we come to the conclusion of this talk. So first, I think the unary computing is definitely an efficient paradigm that it has the potential to revolutionize the computation in this era of deep learning, no matter it's on the edge or in the cloud. And second, the UGEM work, what I find is if we have a good theory, it can definitely help to overcome the challenges and to make our life easier. And the third is the U brain design. So while everyone is doing code design now, even for the unit computing, it is. And for unit computing, we can gain more with proper code design. And the last one for the carrot work, we use the temporal code, uh, temper, uh, coding for the in the unit computing so that it does not lose any kind of accuracy. And so that it has a potential for high performance computing instead of just edge computing. So that's the end of this talk and uh, really excited. So welcome for any questions.